elements that will come out and play a role in the destruction of the Romanovs. This fellow, um, Rasputin, we'll talk more about, interestingly, he has been demonized throughout history, and I think in many ways appropriately, for his particular relationship and influence with the Tsarina. But notice that he advised the Tsar not to go to war in 1914. And think of the implications had the Tsar listened to him at that particular time and decided that they were not, Russia was not going to go support the Serbs and the Slavs and challenge Austria Hungary and then end up having to confront Germany. The picture on the right is where he was murdered. Uh, you, there are various stories about they tried to poison him, then they had to shoot him, and then they finally threw him into the river, the Neva River, because this was in Petrograd, not in Moscow. And he was eventually found, you know, days later in the ice somewhere. <clears throat> I want this, I want you to read this for a minute. I won't read it to you. But it emphasizes some of the dynamics that were going on in the Russian government at this particular time. And think about the language that you are seeing in front of you that was spoken in the Duma about the senior officials who had been appointed to positions of great power and influence in the Russian government. And this kind of outlines who people were. And I don't expect you to remember any parts of this in terms of who is who. But this particular description, I mean, to end this by saying, does it matter, practically speaking, whether we are dealing with stupidity or treason? Now, all we have to do is think about some of the comments that have been made in our own government just recently about various representatives, not even at the senior level. This is talking about prior to January 20 when the administrations changed. And even subsequently, I think it was Representative Hawley, and I may have that wrong, who's actually was attacked by another representative with potentially treasonous behavior. So here you are, 100 years earlier, you're seeing something very similar. But this emphasizes the instability of the Russian government. Now, I show these characters because they're going to be very, very prominent as we go along. And again, I'm not going to read the slide to you. You all are familiar with some of the names here, Lenin and Trotsky in particular, and Kerensky, who is now going to be the uh, president of the Russian Republic once the Tsar abdicates. But these are radicals, and they are in positions of authority. Now, Lenin is still in Switzerland at this particular moment. He hasn't yet made it to Russia. That will happen. But he has been creating a dynamic through his publications and contacts in Russia to undermine very specifically the Russian prosecution of the war. He wants and has been very explicit. He wants Russia to lose. Because if Russia loses, that's where he sees the possibility of the rise of the proletariat and the triumph of his particular ideology. What about Italy? <clears throat> Italy has been fighting for almost two years as we get to 1917 and they've accomplished very, very little. What did they need if they were going to help prosecute the war when you sit down at the Chantilly conference and decide what's going to happen? Well, you've only got one enemy you can attack, Austria. Where can you attack them? On the Isonzo front. There's not much point in trying to go through the Alps, all right? It's just logistically impossible. But you've been stymied on the Isonzo front. 
you've had very minor gains with enormous losses. Therefore, when you think about how to conduct this fighting, you have to think very carefully about what has worked before and what hasn't worked before. And one of the key elements was that you needed a lot of artillery. When you look at the casualties from World War I, the vast majority of the casualties were suffered from artillery fire. It's always nice to go, when I say nice, for the movies to show going over the top and people getting shot down by machine gun fire. You know, big, big example, the movie Gallipoli with uh, Mel Gibson in it, you know. And if you look at films on the Battle of the Somme, movies or even documentaries, you know, machine gun fire, that's, that's what killed everybody. No, it was artillery fire. So the Italians needed it because their manufacturing base was insufficient. Another little side part to this <coughs> is the economy of France became so efficient in terms of its manufacturing that they could supply the American army when it came, reached a total of 2 million, all right? Eventually, by the end of the war, there were 2 million Americans either getting on board ship in the United States or well over a million already in France, all equipped primarily by the French, <clears throat> in addition to their own armies. The United States provided loans and maybe manufactured ammunition, but compared to our contribution economically directly was nowhere near what the French were doing. And the French had already lost a large amount of territory where they had coal mines and other mines in the northeastern portion that were now taken by the Germans. So we forget this particular kind of balance. Italy never had the resources to do a great deal on its own. And their manpower and economic reserves were being severely depleted. Cadorna was the general in chief of the Italian armies. And because of the failures that had been perceived by the government and by the public, again, this led to significant changes at the top as we moved into 1917. Salandra had been the prime minister. Notice that it was only in the middle of 16 that he was replaced. <clears throat> Baselli becomes minister from that point and he lasts well into 17, but then Orlando takes over. Notice that Orlando is there like Clemenceau only for the last year of the war. We give an enormous amount of prestige to Clemenceau and Lloyd George and Orlando and talking about the Treaty of Versailles later and so on. These guys were in charge for about a year. All of the stuff that preceded them was done by others. Cadorna, you'll see lasts for a good while through uh, over three years, but eventually as we'll learn as we get into 1917 details that, that he eventually is found to be not able to manage the Italian armies. He's lost the confidence of the government. He's going to be replaced. Again, if you want to look at examples with the United States, go back to the Civil War and think of how many times the most senior general McClellan was either elevated to command over Winfield Scott or then demoted uh, and charge given to John Pope and then reinstated and then removed and given to Burnside and so on and so forth. I mean, what does that tell you about the government as well as about their relationship with their senior military commanders? You know, does anybody know what's going on? I mean, you'd look at that and think, well, they're all incompetent. <laughs> so what about the United States? We're not in the war yet, not at, not at the end of 1916, as you're aware, but we were meeting a number of different challenges. And in particular, we still had a strong sense of isolationism. But here's something of critical importance, again, which you can either look at as a positive or a negative. And that is what did Wilson see coming 
And how did he prepare the United States for it? Did he shape the narrative or did he allow events to shape what his responses would be? Again, think about it as an example with FDR. Prior to World War II, FDR was very clear in his own mind for a number of years prior to actually joining the war that it was critical for the United States to work closely with Britain in particular. And he had to start shaping not just the public perception, but he had to also shape industry, the economy, in such a way as to bring forward the United States military forces to confront those powers which he felt were going to be of the greatest danger, Germany and Japan. Now, whether he did it well or not is a different issue. It's not clear that Wilson made any direct attempt to shape the narrative of the American people. And there are excuses that are offered for that, and those are not unreasonable excuses, but it does go to the heart of what the expectations are as we Americans look at our president. And as we look at the events occurring around us, this is one of the reasons why these lectures to me are powerful in terms of what I learn. And that is that I begin to look at these people who are running our government and I think differently about what it is they're trying to accomplish. Now, they have a lot more information than I do and that's fine, I do what I can to sort it out. But conversely, it's a matter of deciding ultimately as the individual person sitting in the Oval Office has to make those decisions. He can have all the advisors he wants, but as Joe Biden said in his last town hall meeting, Although I was the last person in the room with President Obama, when I walked out, it was he alone who had to make those decisions. And I think that's a powerful visual reference we need to have when we think about what we're asking of these leaders. These particular events also point out the following, and we'll deal with this in greater detail in the subsequent lectures. Wilson used Colonel House as a personal emissary. Now there's been some criticism leveled against all presidents when they have a personal emissary go off who's not a part of the cabinet or a matter even of a diplomatic service, not an ambassador. Or we could call him an ambassador without portfolio. But it allowed Wilson to send House to various governments and have very private conversations that did not commit the United States to any particular course of action, but could serve as a conduit for information back and forth and understanding positions and alternatives. This particular kind of activity was necessarily very secret, even though <laughs> you see from the 14 points as part of that, when we'll come to it later in a lecture, that you know, open covenants openly arrived at. Well, that just doesn't work in government. So forget it, okay? This is part of the necessary function of an executive. And this was true less of the European countries than it was of the United States. So we had our own peculiarities to manage. The other thing about Wilson, which I will mention because I think it has great importance in understanding the man, was that he was the embodiment of what was then called the progressive movement. Now the progressive movement with a large capital P was very much based on the concept of centralization of authority in the federal government. He had actually written a paper in 1887 in which he outlined that business as conducted under typical capitalism was not only inefficient, but in a way destructive. And that it would ultimately be necessary for government through its experts, not defined, but that's the word that was used, through its experts to determine what should be produced in what quantities. Now, 
in terms of a general process, of course, that could not be something that you would talk about if you wanted to become president of the United States. But when you are now running a war, the centralization of administration and action is a requirement to remove the inefficiencies that normally occur with, we'll call it relatively unbridled capitalism. So in a sense, his own particular philosophy fit with the particulars of how the war was going to be run, at least from the United States perspective. Coupled with that, and we'll look at this in more detail later, is how his philosophy is outlined in the 14 points and how the 14 points have an enormous effect on the conduct of the war later on. And that's part of the dynamic we'll come to a little bit later. I mentioned these here and I'm not gonna leave it up for everybody to read, but the point I'm trying to make is that when you look at this, there's a global nature to what he is offering. This isn't a matter of power politics and territorial exchanges in the usual manner. He's reached beyond the issues of government and he's reaching to general people, the populations of all of these various nations. And he's saying to them, these are principles which we believe are universal and should be applied universally. Now that's a totally different narrative because in a sense it undermines the sovereignty of any particular government. And remember that during World War I, most of the countries involved had an aristocracy. The aristocracies may have had different political influences such as in France where it really had no influence at this point being a Republic after Louis Napoleon III is gotten rid of. And in England where the monarch has very limited power constitutionally but among most all the other participants, and indeed across the world, the vast majority of countries were governed by an aristocracy. Wilson is offering something extraordinarily different. And this has a resonance that permeates what's going to happen not only in 17, in 18, and subsequently. It's a huge effect. He has Blackjack Pershing, whom he's going to designate as the leader of the American Armed Forces in Europe, the American Expeditionary Force, as it's called, eventually reaching a total of nearly 2 million people. I put George C. Marshall up because he was only a captain and later became what's called a brevet colonel. That's because during wartime, you can have your rank increase, but in the regular army, you revert back to where you were. George Marshall worked closely uh, as chief of staff, which is a different designation in the American army than it is in the French army, for example. Uh, and Marshall, as some of you may recall, is probably one of the best examples, if, and I'm going to be a little super patriotic here, of Americans in charge as he worked with uh, Franklin Roosevelt during World War II, and then as he was Secretary of State and had the Marshall Plan and things of this sort. The man was absolutely brilliant. And this is where he started, if you will. <clears throat> the world at war, just to give you an idea, um, this was a world war in terms of all the countries that are involved. I'm not going to leave this slide up here for very long. The vast majority of the fighting occurred in Europe, as you can see in that black area that represents the central powers and down into the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. But there was fighting in East Africa the Japanese had taken over German islands pretty much without any conflict. There had been some naval battles in the Pacific and in the South Atlantic at the Falklands. These were of no great long-term consequence, unlike what was going on in World War II. But again, the world as a whole was involved. Now, what about Germany and what about uh, the Central Powers? Well, again, <clears throat> 
there's a great change that takes place at the top. Now, Kaiser Wilhelm remains in charge, but his influence becomes severely diminished in the conduct of the war as a result of other changes that occur within the government. Falkenhayn, who was in charge of the general armies of all of Germany, both Eastern Front and so on and so forth, is now actually not eliminated. He's demoted and he becomes an army commander on the Eastern Front. Hindenburg and Ludendorff, <clears throat> having been very successful in their uh, achievements on the Eastern Front, are now brought to manage the war as a whole. And they develop the strategy, which is going to go forward through 17 and 18, with Hindenburg in time becoming less of a, a real influence. Uh, pretty much every history speaks about Ludendorff as running the war at this point. Uh, I haven't read any personal histories about Hindenburg. I suspect that he was engaged, but perhaps less forceful in deciding what was going to be done. The key issue the Germans decided upon were the following. Unrestricted submarine warfare. There was a huge controversy, I mean, bitter, bitter controversy that took place over unrestricted submarine warfare. The foreign minister, Bethman Hallwig, who was uh, absolutely against this idea, said, all you're going to do is drag the United States into the war. You're going to undermine any ability we have to negotiate with anybody. This is just not possible. But Hindenburg and Ludendorff were able to build a coalition which effectively cut Bethmann Hallwig out of the mix and ultimately led to his replacement <clears throat> because he no longer was effective. It was promoted in part by some other things which happened in the Reichstag right around this time, which we'll touch on later. But emphasize again the disruptions that were occurring in all the governments and the transfers of power centers within governments and conduct of the war. This was happening at the end of 16 into 17. Hindenburg and Ludendorff also felt that a critical target was to undermine the morale in Russia. It became explicit when the February Revolution took place and the Tsar abdicated. We'll talk about that later. And the Germans were prepared at that time to take great action in order to further the demise, if you will, of the Russian influence in the war. Zimmerman, who ended up writing this infamous telegram, which he sent over American US cables, but was intercepted by the British who were monitoring US cables, <laughs> uh, you know, triggered another response. But in terms of actually drawing the United States into the war, it was probably the unrestricted submarine warfare. And again, like the assassination at Sarajevo, the Zimmerman telegram was probably the letter heard around the world at that particular point. So changes in the government were profound and commonplace. Wilhelm, Bethmann Hallwig, as I said, he gets kicked out eventually as chancellor in uh, 1917. Hindenburg, Ludendorff. Uh, Hindenburg's reputation is maintained. Ludendorff, is demonized at the end of the war for the losses. I show uh, Michaelis here because he takes over from Bethwin Halwig and he'll have some influence on what goes on later on in Hurtling, who takes over from Michaelis. And you'll see that as stresses increase through the war, various people who are given a great deal of authority allegedly in government are replaced. And a good part of the move to replace these people comes from the Hindenburg-Ludendorff combination. They could actually threaten resignation, you know, their own resignations if their requirements are not met. And this again exemplifies the transition of power centers within the various governments. <clears throat> and you'll see here that uh, 
Prince Max von Baden, as they get to the end of the war and they know that this is all going to finish up, becomes chancellor and he lasts for about a month because he wants no part of what's going on later. This just to show again how fast these things changes. What about Austria? One of the key things that happens here is that Franz Joseph dies. And because of the dynamics that exist within the empire of Austria-Hungary, the dual empire, or the dual monarchy as it's called, is that Emperor Karl takes over and he immediately uh, decides that he wants to have Count Zernan as his foreign minister and Conrad von Holzendorf, uh, who is in charge of the Austrian armies, is going to end up being replaced later on. And Stauffenberg is going to be, uh, Stauffenberg, I'm sorry, is going to be uh, put in his place. But one of the things Karl believed intensely was that he didn't see a good outcome for Austria if they continued to fight. He had been given a great deal of information which talked about the dissolution of the economy, the loss of manpower, their inability to sustain the conflict, even feed their own people uh, through 1917. And he was going to seek a way of getting out of this war if he possibly could. And this prompted what we'll see later on. So here we are, Emperor Karl, and notice that he's uh, roughly 39 at the time he takes over. I'm sorry, um, yeah, about 39 or so. And uh, his wife, Ziska, I believe, has family who are in France and Belgium. And that'll come out a little bit later as well. So there's an interesting set of dynamics. As you may know, the King of England and Kaiser Wilhelm and the Tsar were all related through Queen Victoria uh, by some means or other. I forget whether they were all cousins or something of that nature. But it indicates how all these aristocratic connections uh, come out during the course of this war. So Ottokar Zernin, he lasts until April of 18. Archduke Frederick becomes the technical commander, or was the technical commander, uh, even though Conrad really ran the war as far as the Austrians are concerned, and he eventually gets replaced. Uh, Franz Conrad von Holzendorf, whom I mentioned, had conducted the first part of the war as chief of staff. He's eventually replaced. Now, what about Turkey? <clears throat> At the end of 1916, Turkey on the surface appeared to be in a good place. They'd eliminated pretty much all internal dissent as it would be called. This was primarily the prosecution of the Armenians and the Greeks and things of that sort. The massacres that took place, genocide, if you're open to having that term used, some people aren't. Uh, they had basically stalled the Russians on the Caucasus front the collapse of Romania had basically meant that the Balkans was settled as far as the Turks were concerned. They didn't have as much of a threat there. So their concentration was more in Mesopotamia, but they had beaten the British at Kut. Uh, although in late 16, 17, that was going to change. And they were pretty static in Palestine and in the Sinai region. So they looked like they were holding up pretty well. And with the collapse of Romania, they also had a supply conduit that could come from the central powers to help them meet their military needs, which they themselves were less capable of meeting. So they looked as though they were pretty good, pretty good shape. And even though there was an allied army at Salonika or Salonika or now Thessalonica, which was in the northeastern part of what we see as modern Greece, that army wasn't going anywhere. They were pretty much stuck in place. So Turkey is saying, we're okay, we're doing all right. The fellow who was in charge, technically Sultan Mehmed V, but basically he was a figurehead. So 
Lehman von Salt and Sanders from Germany was ending, it says here, head of the military mission, but he had a great deal to do with the conduct of the war, particularly as it related to Gallipoli and subsequently into Palestine. The real leaders here were these guys. And these particular guys were the ones who crushed internal dissent, uh, prosecuted what I will call the Armenian genocide, and determined that nothing would be done without their say-so, and they would exert dictatorial control over everything. They would brook no dissent. So these were very um, powerful individuals. They were very determined to keep Turkey as united as an empire as they could to achieve their particular strategic goals. And they were unabashed about whatever violence was necessary to ensure that. We'll see that elsewhere. In the Arabian Peninsula and the Hejaz, things were a bit different. The Ottoman rule there was much softer, much less influential, partly because of the vast distances for which there was no modern communication systems. There was a railway that led down to Mecca and Medina, but the vast majority of what was present in the rest of the Arabia Peninsula and even over towards Mesopotamia, even in the regions of Baghdad and so on, uh, had very poor communications involved. And these gentlemen were influenced largely by resistance to the central Ottoman authorities and in part co-opted by the British, particularly this fellow T.E. Lawrence who was sent over to liaise with the uh, various Arab tribes at the time. Remember, there were no specific political organizations at that time. You didn't have Saudi Arabia, you didn't have Abu Dhabi, and you didn't have the United Arab Emirates. None of those places existed. They were all part of the Ottoman Empire. And the idea was to develop rebellion, disperse Turkish activity, ultimately raid lines of communication, to disrupt the ability of the Turks to supply the front lines, particularly in the Gaza Sinai region uh, and less so in other areas. Now, um, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes <clears throat> dealing with the peace initiatives because once we have gone through this particular part of it and you realize that at this point, again, go back to SLA Marshall's uh, comments at the very beginning of this set of lectures. This 1916, the nadir of the war. Everything looked like it's falling apart. And at this point, pretty much everybody is trying to find a way out of the war. Nothing seems to be getting accomplished. It's been from August of 1914 through December of 1916, What's been accomplished? Very little, except for the death and destruction of people, the treasuries, the economies, the social fabric, the political fabric, as we just went over, is all falling apart. What is it that's happening here that makes this important? It's because everybody began to think, how do we end this thing? what kind of requirements are we gonna put forward and how are we going to initiate the conversations because we're fighting each other. So these are a whole set of some of the more important initiatives that took place. And I'll touch on them as we go and then we'll come back uh, once we start the next set of lectures next Monday to deal in more depth with some of the other things going on. Sixth de Bourbon, he was called Sixth because he was the sixth son and brother of Zita, the wife of Emperor Karl of Austria. Now I mentioned this because I mentioned it earlier to see that the initiative 
to find a solution of peace starts not from Emperor Carl particularly, but from his wife saying to her brother, listen, you have all these connections. How about if you start talking to the French politicians in particular, that's where he was going to be putting most of his emphasis and find out what they're willing to consider in achieving peace with us, Austria, Hungary. Where's Germany in this? <laughs> Where's Turkey in this? I mean, if Austria, Hungary came to a peace solution and opted out of the war, I mean, you can imagine the implications of that. But this is what happens. Emperor Karl, on the other hand, wants to use his foreign minister, Zernan, to start talking and see how he can come to some kind of solution to make this work. Sixtus was not trained in diplomacy in any particular way. Uh, he was one of those well-intentioned characters who'd been prevailed upon by his sister to explore what he could and find out what initiatives would happen. And as is typical for most people put in this position of, I'll call it pseudo authority, there's a great tendency to go a bit further than you really should go in either commitments or at least in opening dialogue into areas like uh, what land are we willing to trade back and forth to settle this issue? You know, what are the particular dynamics? And as a result, <clears throat> the Sixtus came into very direct conflict through Carl getting information now from both sides and ends up saying, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, Sixtus, you're out of the picture eventually, you know, just go away and I'll deal with Zernan, but Zernan has already been undermined because what the uh, Entente powers, France in particular, have been told is not something that he's in agreement with. And he'd have to go back to them when he's pursuing his own initiatives and say, well, you shouldn't have listened to that guy. You know, he had no particular authority. And that frankly gives the opponents the possibility of playing one off against the other well, but we were told this and we thought that was a good idea and you're not willing to give on that. So, you know, how are we supposed to deal with you? You can see how this creates problems. And this wasn't the end of it by any stretch. <clears throat> so Zernan ends up at one point, as you'll see on the fourth bullet here, that he had sent a letter as part of the initiative that was to reach a peace agreement of saying basically the following. Emperor Karl knows that Germany wishes to retain Alsace-Lorraine, which they had controlled since the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Karl also knew through diplomatic conversations and all the rest of the things that occur, that Germany wished to hang on to Belgium, if not own it, to at least control elements of it. And there was even a more extreme wing in the German party, which we'll talk about subsequently, which wanted even to hang on to portions of Northeastern France. In other words, we're going to control what we already own. You know, possession is nine tenths of the law. Karl thought that's that's just hogwash. What I'll offer is that I will support returning Alsace Lorraine to France in exchange for reaching a peace agreement, which leaves the Austria-Hungarian Empire intact. Now that's at variance from the 14 points. Even though Karl supported a number of the 14 points, he was gonna pick and choose out of those. And one of the things he did not wanna see happen was all the different ethnicities that made up the Austro-Hungarian empire suddenly decide for themselves what political entity they wish to have. 
Otherwise, he's just destroyed his own nation. And he's not about to do that. But there was a letter sent to Clemenceau, and eventually, like most things, there are leaks. Sound familiar? Well, when this leak comes out, and there's a big one that occurs out in Russia later on, basically the population and a lot of that means through their advisors and various people surrounding Emperor Carl end up saying, what the hell are you doing? You can't do this. How can you stab Germany in the back, oops, <laughs> in order to, to gain a peace for yourself? You know, you're really going to do that? We're Germanic people here, talking about Austria as opposed to Hungary, which was primarily Slavic in terms of its ethnicity. So this created a real problem for everybody. In Germany, <clears throat> Matthias Erzberger, whom I showed a picture of, I think, earlier on, uh, is running in the Reichstag as a deputy leader. But what he does is he felt, and he had real good information given to him, all right? Perhaps by opposition groups, perhaps through his own wick and study, that it was estimated that if they fought a war for another year, fought this war for another year, the country would collapse utterly. And as a result, they promoted this thing you'll see down there called the Reichstag Resolution of 1917. The idea behind this was to find a moderate way to end the war peacefully. And it involved certain trade-offs. But because it had originated in the Reichstag, which admittedly had some authority, but was still challenging the power of Wilhelm and particularly Hindenburg and Ludendorff. This created great difficulty. And in part, this was another reason why Bethman Hallwig was eventually fired. It wasn't just over the controversy over unrestricted submarine warfare, though that was a key element but it was considered by Wilhelm and particularly Hindenburg and Ludendorff that Bethmann Hallwig had not controlled the Reichstag thoroughly enough, that he permitted somehow this particular resolution to be brought forward and made public, which undermined the authority of the government in other ways. It was incompatible with what Hindenburg and Ludendorff felt was necessary for Germany to receive something in a peace agreement, which was worth the costs of the war to this point. Again, think of it as though you are a, a citizen of Germany at this time, you have been fighting for, had your sons, daughters, husbands, fathers, whatever, involved in this conflict, maybe had personal tragedies of one sort or another, seen the disruption of your country, and you want to go back to status quo ante, nothing accomplished, all of this cost, all of this death, and if anything, you lose Alsace-Lorraine back to France. How is that possible, acceptable? You're going to walk away from all those costs and say, oh, this is just fine. You know, No, no, you're not going to do that. It's going to be very, very difficult to do that. And so this resolution went nowhere. What about the Pope? Well, as a moral force, he had a pulpit, <laughs> use that term advisedly, and he could offer certain things which he felt might serve as a basis for peace. What he did not seem to realize is that too many of these were non-starters for the very reasons I just outlined. And I'll spend a little bit of time on this and then we'll conclude this lectures because it's getting near eight o'clock and I imagine all of you are either in need of another bathroom break, dinner, or a cup of coffee, or something of <laughs> more easily tolerated. 
But let me put this forward to you because this kind of emphasis dovetails closely with Wilson's 14 points. The Pope is reaching for a different plane of engagement. He's looking not for the realpolitik, which had governed Europe for centuries prior to this war. He's now reaching to a different plane altogether, as does the 14 points, as does the Bolsheviks when we get there. The diminution in armaments, international arbitration, it's a little bit like the League of Nations. Who's going to be in charge of arbitrating? Who's going to be the judge? True liberty and common rights over the sea, freedom of navigation. Renunciation of war indemnities. Nobody's going to have to pay the other for the damage done. Think about the destruction that has occurred in northeastern France. The villages, towns, everything that's been wrecked and destroyed. France is going to have to rebuild that without any assistance from Germany, which, from their perspective, attacked them. This is like letting the perpetrator, if you're French, get off for robbing you and going back home. And yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it. No cash bail <laughs> if you want to get a little political in New York. An examination of rival claims. <coughs> <coughs> this was a non-starter. <coughs> and even Clemenceau derided this later on when he became more powerful. This was a non-starter. It sounded good on paper, but it had no possibility whatsoever of being accepted by any of the participants in the war, none. So what did all this mean? This means the war will go on. And what happens from 1917 through 1918, the subject of our next three sessions, we will explore in more detail and try to tease out some of the threads that we've just covered in order to show how those particular threads are eventually woven into a real fabric that has a very direct effect on the conduct of the war, not just militarily, but ideologically, and how these particular transformations have an enormous influence on the rest of the 20th century. Thank you for your attendance. I will stay here for a bit if people have other questions or comments they wish to make, but I will conclude today's lectures at this point. Okay, I think you could stop sharing your screen if you want to. And everybody else should unmute themselves if they wish to stay and ask questions. I have a uh, minor question um, on the chart that showed, I think it's Mehmet the fifth. Yes. Uh, the dates will look a little screwy. Um, I can double check that. You may be quite right, Art. Uh, I can go back up and see if I can find him. He's pretty close by. There he is. There he is. Yeah, rain up. Uh, yeah, 1918. Henry, you told me nobody would pay attention to that. Christmas <laughs> stinks. Now, yeah. now look what's happened. I've been, I told you it's my sources. <laughs> Actually, uh, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do here. <laughs> yeah, well, he appointed my great aunt to uh, be, to run a hospital in Istanbul. So that must be must be where you got that information. <laughs> my long dead great aunt. Very good. And I was being so conscientious. Oh my gosh, Art. Thank you. No, I'll <laughs> fix it. <laughs> hey, uh, hi. Yes. Uh, 
my, my maiden name is Ebert, E B E R T, oh. and I think he was assassinated. I, I don't know if you went that far into his uh, history, but I think he was the first German, you know, president actually. Uh, but he, I think, he was assassinated. My goodness, um, I don't recall that specifically, but thank you. I, I appreciate any pieces of information like this are really delightful to have because what happens to these people <laughs> after the war is right? important. <laughs> right. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, you bet. It's my to next time. Yes. Truly a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. See you next Monday, I hope. Yes, indeed. We sure will. <laughs> Definitely. All righty. The guy whose name is spelled C-Z-E-R-N-I-N is Cherny. Oh, is that the proper pronunciation? Yeah. Ah, you see? I'm an English major. <laughs> you, you know, you, you look at it and you pronounce it as an Englishman. <laughs> One of my best friends in Austria. Ah. <clears throat> I will, I will say as a warning to those of you who are still listening at this point, too, that some of the things that I will discuss may um, be very political in terms of their particular orientation and some comparisons that I may make. I draw these out not because I will tell you that these comparisons are true and you must understand them in the way in which I present them. But what I always try to do is to show that events that occurred in this era, now a hundred years ago, still permeate where we are today. Mm -hmm. And some of the implications of particularly what I will emphasize repeatedly, the transformation in 1917 into 1918 is extraordinary in world affairs from my perspective. Uh, you can accept it or not, I, I, I get that. I'm not here to convince anyone that you must you know, think as I do about it. But I want that perspective, a very important element of what I try to do with these lectures. Which, by the way, are being recorded, although I missed the first half. Uh, first oh. half and I forgot to turn on my record button, yes, too, so it's I even know. worse. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's a good thing. There's no, there's no document. <laughs> well, I, I, we're supposed to let everybody know beforehand, and I didn't get a chance to do that. But, well, uh, I'm glad they dropped my whole app. The whole app disappeared from my tablet. So oh my goodness, Barry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, too bad. I got back in though. <laughs> um, uh, Michael. Yes. I'd ask, uh, what, would you, um, or are you planning to get into the implications of the peace settlement, particularly Wilson's uh, 14 points and the idea of of national self-determination and all of the unintended consequences of that doctrine? Um, the answer is yes, with a little bit of a caveat. I'll come back to the last slide that I showed. Uh, I'll just bring it up here quickly <clears throat> on Wilson's 14 points and talk a little bit more in depth about them. And when I get to the very end of the war and we're talking about the Versailles Treaty in particular, uh, there'll be other elements that I'll bring out there. But you've hit on a very important element. And that is that as far as I now look at this last two years of the war, the change in government goals from power politics that I put on that one of my original slides to ideology mm -hmm. takes front and center. And when you start dealing with ideology, 
you begin to deal with a very different dynamic of the purpose of government and the role of international politics. It mm -hmm. becomes utterly transformative. And I think particularly at this period of time as all of us are sort of aware from the 20s and 30s following this war, largely responsible for what happens. Without this transformation into ideology, power politics probably, and again, it's my own interpretation, probably would have played out the way it did in previous conflicts. Territories get traded, there are different agreements that are reached on cross you know, boundaries of borders, things of that sort, different economic relationships, things of that sort. But the introduction of ideology goes to a different plane. And they're embodied within the concept of ideology, a certain level of truthfulness. And I'll talk about this more when we're actually in the lectures because yeah. it is predominantly in the Bolsheviks that you see this play out immediately. Well, From the standpoint well, I, of the introduction by the United States and Wilson in particular, this being his particular approach, not the government's approach. This isn't something that the Senate and the House ratified and said, we agree with it. This is something he did mm -hmm. that has a profound impact on what's going to happen after the war is concluded. Well, I think that this is a conversation that is particularly apropos at this time with the idea of uh, the rise of nationalism and what is a nation? Is it a political unit or is it a, for better term, an ethnic unit? I think that's an excellent observation. And we could have that discussion uh, either now, or if you wanna reserve that and bring it up in our subsequent lectures where you think it would be worth it, particularly when we take a break, because then everybody can engage who's already been mm -hmm. primed mm -hmm. to understand that. The shift between power politics, real politic is the term I used, and ideological politics is a profound change. And it is still with us today. Mm -hmm. There's always been a concept of nationalism and a concept of homogeneity within nations. I mean, if you really want to look nowadays at nations that are particularly homogeneous and appear to be relatively stable as a result. You might look at, say, uh, China, mainland China or Japan, um, and well, say, these are very homogeneous populations and therefore very stable. If you look where there's a, you know, I'll, I'll use our term, a melting pot, there's less stability. Now that doesn't mean that a place like Mexico which is relatively homogeneous, is stable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we already know it isn't for various reasons, but you know, the dynamics are a little different there in terms of that. Well, if you know, you're talking about the difference between realities on the ground and abstractions. Right. But the well, abstractions are moving more toward privileging, excuse a modern term, right. abstractions. Well, you take take Scandinavia, for example, particularly Norway, and you, you, you can see the transition, Tom, from what was once a, a totally homogenous uh, nation, mm -hmm. as, as it, it's not become unstable entirely, but they, because they've managed it very well, but it's, it's not as homogenous and it's not therefore as stable as it once was due to the immigration that's come from the, from the south. <laughs> that they can also yeah. set a Germany uh, after World War II. Yeah. Well, you can deal with the abstractions as long as they're pretty much congruent with the reality on the ground. Yeah, exactly. When the reality on the ground changes, the abstractions break down. Mm 
Well, when they break down, then you have a real question as to what is a nation, in fact. You're absolutely right about that. Right. Yeah. And, and this is introduced by what Wilson is talking about right here. When he talks about, and it's, uh, let's see, uh, which one of these? Adjustment of Italy's border by nationality. Yeah. Um, you know, those kinds of things, adjustment of colonial claims, which is when, when if you're living in Kenya and you are a native Kenyan and you see adjustment of colonial claims, what does that mean to you? That means get the damn British out of here, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in India, you're saying, get the British out of here. You know, we're, we don't want to be a colony anymore. And this is part of the beginning of it as it, as it goes. And, you know, various people given autonomy and things of that sort uh, are reaching beyond the nation state as it was understood by particularly Europe and North America, uh, to some degree South America, they were still struggling over a lot of different issues, but they had become nation states primarily. Uh, China was still disrupted as a problem. We're not gonna really go down that road just yet. But with multi-ethnic <laughs> nations like the Austria-Hungarian nation in particular, these particular elements resonated and rose up within people a sense of ethnic identity and saying we want our own political system that's built around our particular ethnicity, our technically or theoretically shared values and culture. And we don't want to be part of this Germanic group, if you're a Slav, for example. Uh, those tensions have existed throughout history. We know that. But the political boundaries were so solidly drawn prior to World War I that the internal tensions that were arising because of these structured political boundaries were now going to be broken. Mm -hmm. And it was going to have enormous repercussions, uh, as we'll see in the subsequent lectures. And that well, should be a coda to this discussion, unless you want to stay on. But I have to get off and eat dinner. And, <laughs> okay. and, and, stamped on. And thank you. I think he should be let. Go, go, go to okay. Mike. <laughs> go All right, Mike. let me raise a glass again. All right. Well, I would you see how much is left. <laughs> well, I thought you'd be drinking a lot more through this lecture. No, I thought I would too, but it's well, been fascinating. Thanks. I'll, I'll, well, thank I'll you see so much. you uh, either call me uh, during the week or I see you next Monday. And thank All you. Right. And thank well, you I'm looking for forward thank to doing you. this because I have another thread to follow on this national.